Good morning. Good morning. Hey, welcome to Ignite. If you're new with us, I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege that you decided to join us. Man, it's a hot, hot day out there. Uh, but but we, we've got a cure for that in a little bit. I get to, I get to get in my shorts and I get to baptize some incredible people and take that uh, as and celebrate with them as they take that next step of obedience in, in their journey with Christ. And so hopefully you guys will stick around immediately following this experience for baptisms. Uh, man, today's just a great day. It's just a special day uh, in the in the life of, of Ignite. It's a special day in my life. Um, you know, you, you go through life sometimes, and, and God places certain people in your life to help you out. Uh, some people in your life for a season. Some people are, uh, maybe it's a short season, but some people are in your life for, a, for the long haul. And it's those types of relationships and people that God put in your life that, that uh, he wants to do something really incredible. And uh, we've got one of our overseers. I have three overseers. They're all incredible men of God. Um, but this one, the... I, I wouldn't tell the others this, but this one's my favorite. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, 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 I tell all my kids, uh, you know, all the time, I, when the boys aren't around, I say, Kendall, you're my favorite kid by far, you know. And it's, uh, you know, it's all. But this, no, seriously, uh, Michael, his name is Michael Smith. It's actually Michael W. Smith. He's the original, you know what I'm saying? And so he's just incredible. Listen, I met him um, before we ever planted this church. Uh, we just started dreaming about this church. The church was a dream. And uh, he, he, he literally pretty much is the brains and runs the organization called ARC, the Association of Related Churches, the church planting organization. Planted over 500 churches here in this country. They're planting churches in like China, Japan, Ireland, Brazil, Canada. It's weird. It's awesome. It's incredible what God's doing all over the earth. But uh, this guy's really come into my life, and it's, it's truly a father-son relationship. He's, he's like a Paul, and I'm like a Timothy to him and so i just appreciate everything that he's done he means so much he's marked my life and uh, he's marked this church um it, it's nice to have a father's blessing on on the house and so would you guys do me a huge favor and get up on your feet and show some honor to pastor michael smith thank you man hey uh stay up here just a minute Hey, you guys be seated. I, uh, I love, love, love this church. It was, it, was in, it, was, it was way back there before it started, like Pastor Heath said, that, uh, you know, he, he and uh, Kenzie came along, and they just began sharing their dream with us as an organization. And we have, we have 30 to 40 guys a week that start to process with us. Not everybody plants a church, but... As they come along, we, we, you know, we have some different systems and application, and we take them through an assessment. We try to figure out, is this the right couple that we need to partner with? And, uh, and so when they came along, there was something that just connected us and connected me personally. So I kind of knew you before you, you were a church and uh, shared that dream and have been to, to Joplin several times. And so I love your pastors. I just think they're the greatest people in the world. Don't you guys love uh, Pastors Heath and Kenzie? Come on up, Kenzie. And, uh, you know, I came here a little bit on a mission this week just to come and just speak a blessing over this couple. And uh, I, I'll tell you this real, real uh, quick story, but they, uh, they came to, uh, they called me up or I, I talked with them and, and just talked maybe uh, maybe eight months ago and pastor he says you know he says i'm not the greatest pastor in the world i i want to i want to be even better he says i've made mistakes he says i'm not always approaching things the right way and he said i just love for you guys to to mentor me and so three of us got together they drove eight to eight or nine hours to birmingham alabama we sat down and we said what areas do you want to grow in and they named several and then uh you know he said, do you see anything that I could grow in? And, you know, I'm always full of opinions, you know. So I said, well, sure, here's a couple, you know. And big list. Big <laughs> list. And, and then uh, Derek, our accountant, and I flew up to Joplin um, a few weeks later. And I just, I said, let's look at the church. This is a great church. The, 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 the culture here, the heart of this church, the heartbeat is great. The presence of the Lord here is great. But I said, let's see, are there any systems? Are there any things you can improve on as a, in the church. 
so we identified some. So we came up with a list. It's a long list, but it's only because, because Pastor Heath said we could, because this is what he wanted. So it was 27 items. And, but it had to do with everything, like make sure you get a, some vacation time in your family, and you take a day off every week, and, you know, and this and that. And, I, and, and so we set a goal of about six months, and we said, you know, I'll fly up there, and, and I'll, just, I'll just bless you. Well, I want to tell you, you'll be so proud. They have completed every one of those items. And with, I mean, just, I'm just so proud. Look, it's... I'll be honest, it's not every pastor that does that. Pastors are, pastors are people. And so it takes kind of a security to just say, hey, I'm open. Show me some weak areas. And, uh, and so I don't think there's a lot of weak areas, but he just said, show me these things. And, and he's worked through it. And I just wanted to come up and just pray over them and just let you know how much we are behind this couple and how much we're behind you guys we believe in you. We love you. Uh, our, our whole ARC world knows what you guys went through in 2011 and how you stepped up to the plate. Many of our churches actually got behind you guys and said, we'll send money, we'll send teams, and you guys were at the forefront of that. So that's my goal. I just wanted to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a word in just a minute, but I just want you to know how much I love this couple and believe in them. And I just, I want to pray, and I'd love for you to just join with me in, in, in believing for them. Would you do that? Lord God, I just thank you so very much for this couple. They love you. You've, you've called them out, and you've put your mantle upon them, and you, get, you, you gave them a, a mantle of being the pastors of this house. There's a gifting in their life. And they've been faithful to it. They've not shirked back. And they've said, we want to be the best pastors and pastor the best church that we possibly can. And so, Lord, I just speak your blessing and your favor on them, Lord. I thank you, God, that even this day there's a shift happening in Ignite Church. That, Lord, you are bringing it up to another place of influence in this city. I pray, God, that many from the city of Joplin... Would be, would be touched by the people of this church. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for giving this couple vision and wisdom and insight. I thank you for giving the, surrounding them with a team, a great team, that, Lord, that will take this church not only to reaching Joplin and this area, but, Lord, I see it effective, effectively moving throughout the earth, uh, affecting places on foreign soils and Lord, that there will even be people that rise up in this church and will go to various places in the church, in the world, and just share things that they've learned here. I thank you, Lord God, for, for, for blessing this house with the finances that are needed for every vision and the people needed for every vision in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, guys. What a wonderful pastor. Hey, can I brag on you guys a little bit too? I just I think you guys have one of the greatest teams around. Don't you don't you love the team here? And I'm telling you, the worship, I just enjoyed the presence of the Lord is here. And you got a great worship. Uh, the the kids teams, I've walked all through that area and the the greeting. Some good stuff going on at Ignite. Can I have an amen? amen. You guys are feeling it, I'm telling you. There are, uh, you, I, I can just walk into places and just sense a hand of the Lord on it. So we're very blessed. Love you guys with everything we've got. I want to just take a few minutes and share a word. I don't have a big outline. If you're an outline junkie and you, you, you like all those, you know, blanks, I've got three blanks for you to fill in. But uh, I just wanted to come and just kind of be a pastor to you. And just, I do feel... I feel that there is a shift that's happening. A shift, when I say that, I mean just kind of a, a little tweak and where all of a sudden there's some momentum. There's some energy behind it. Do you know what I mean? We need that sometimes. Sometimes you kind of go through, you're trying to pay off some debt and it just seems like you pay off one and here comes another. And then all of a sudden, 
you kind of feel this lift like, man, I, th I, th I, think, I think there's some energy here. This thing's beginning to happen. You've probably heard this before, but they say that that's the way the eagle does. It gets up on a, on a big rock high up, and instead of just flapping its wings, it just waits for a warm air current to come along. And when it does, it just spreads out its wings, and the warm air current lifts it, and it begins to soar. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for flapping. I flap a lot, but I like it much better when I soar. How about you? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, when you just kind of feel it and you say, oh, I can ride this wave. Let me just spread out my wings. And then you just, and I think that's what God is doing. I feel like he's doing that in some of you guys today. I really do. I feel like that there's some things that maybe you've been working and working and, uh, and, 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 and God wants to bring that. Now, there is, in the book of Genesis, there are some great stories. If you're new to the Bible and you want to read some stories, the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, is 50 chapters long. Uh, it might take you several days to read it, but it is, it is really remarkable. And one of the stories in there is about the nation of Israel that we know today. It was their very beginnings, and they were back in this uh, they had migrated down to Egypt. There was a famine in the land, and they went down to Egypt, and they kind of went down as a small clan, about 70 of them. But they really started multiplying, and they grew. And uh, the Egyptians, they didn't handle it right. I think, I mean, it was the hand of the Lord for the way it played out. God had said it would, handle, it would come about like this. But the Egyptians, instead of integrating them into the society and making them a part... The, the Egyptians just stayed off. They let them do their thing. And so the, the Israel uh, family was over here, and they just started multiplying. Well, the Egyptians started oppressing them. They just started treating them badly. And then they, they, they enslaved them. It's kind of the first real picture of slavery in the Bible. And it was, it was pretty serious. I mean, it was being a slave is very... Um, it's degrading, it's demeaning. Every ounce of expression of how God designed you and made you and your gifts, it's all out the window. There's nothing. You're just, you're just a slave. You get up every day, you obey the one that's over you. And that's really what their life became. All, all their giftings, all their leadership, it was just out there. It didn't matter. I mean, it could be a guy that could have run a multi-billion dollar company and he's a slave could have been a housewife that was meant to just be a great mom and maybe should be a mom a little bit, but she's a slave. And so it, and, and it just got worse. They started beating them. And then they, um, uh, they, 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 they said, we got to stop all this multiplying. And so every time they would have a baby, they would intentionally, if the baby was a boy, they would kill the child, which I, I, I can't imagine going through that, you know, for, for nine months, and then, and then you have a boy, and they want to take your boy. And so it just be, it, it began to be awful, and, as you could imagine. And so this is where we kind of pick up the story, is they're down there in this land of Egypt, and um, just very, very low, very dark place. I'm not even sure any of them really knew the Lord. I'm going to be honest. Their ancestors did? Their... their, their uh, their, their, their ancestor was Abraham. If you've read much of the Bible, you know that God had promised Abraham that he was going to give them the, the, this land that's currently known as Israel. He said, I'm going to give this to your families. But they're down there. They don't even know the Lord. So I want to pick up, and I, and and I want to give you three words this morning. The first word is the word uh, hope, because when you're in a situation like that, what you need is hope. Hope. Now, look, this, this is physical enslavement, but I don't think in our world, I don't think sometimes we're far off from this. We, we're not physically enslaved here, but I tell you, a lot of us have got ourselves in some very dark places. There are people that get up every morning, and the first thing they have to do is they've got to figure out where they're going to get their supply that day, where they're going to get their meds that day, where they're going to get their drugs that day. Or there's people that are in... Uh, that are in patterns in their life, they're, they're, they're depressed, and they can't see their future. They're just stuck. 
All I know is I'm trying to get through today. And you might be in that place. You just say, you know, I just feel like the walls have just closed in on me. And there is a word. There is a hope that God brings. And I want you to look at this in Exodus um, chapter 3 and uh, verse 7, I believe it is. And uh, the Lord said, he spoke to this guy Moses, and he said, I have seen the suffering of my people. I've heard their cries. I'm concerned about what's going on, and I've come down to rescue them. That's interesting, isn't it? Have you ever thought about the Lord having eyes? You know, God is up there. You know, we kind of think of him as smoke or a big puff of gas or something. You know, he's moving around. But he's, look, he, we've, we've been created in his image. And, and he says, look, I've seen with my eyes. I see what's happening down there. I can hear their cries. I don't think they're even crying out to the Lord. I think they're just crying out under the pressure of it. They go home at night. Their backs are bloody from being beaten. They, they see that you know, their children are taken. There's no hope at all, no future at all, no light at the end of the tunnel. They can't even hardly see the tunnel. They're just in it. And God says, I've, I've seen with my eyes. I've heard their cries. I'm concerned about this, and I'm coming down. I don't know if you think about, have thought about that, but God, God is a pursuer. This is one thing I've learned about the Lord. It would, it would be enough if God just came to save us. But it says in Luke chapter 10 that the Son of Man doesn't just come to save, but he comes to seek and to save. I love that about God. That's the way I was led to the Lord. Not when I was crying out to the Lord. He actually sought me out. And I think many of you could probably say that same, that same story. You're just walking along, you stumble into church, or you meet somebody. You think it's very random. It's not random. It's strategic. The Lord's had his hand on you. And he's, he's, he says, I, I, I want that guy. Well, here the Lord is injecting himself into a people that don't even really know him. But he says, I, I, this is not the life I have for them to live. I, 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 I have... Um, at my house, I have, just probably like you, I have a little trash dispenser, a trash, uh, what do you call it, container on two wheels. And I wheel it down my driveway every Tuesday night because on Wednesday morning, the trash truck comes. And, you know, it has the little arms. Does y'all have one of those? Yeah. So I do that every Tuesday night. My next-door neighbor, Scott, I live on a little, just a little short hill, but my driveway is a little hill, so I kind of wheel it down. My neighbor, Scott, See him, he's taking his. My neighbor Charlie across the street, he's doing his. Miss Kathy over there, Miss Julie over there, you know. And so I may look up and I see Scott. I say, Scott, how's it going? Scott says, great. I said, boy, it's hot lately. He said, yeah, it is. See you later, he says. I said, I'll see you later. I walk back up the hill. I go in my house. I shut the door. Go. Scott goes back up the hill, goes in his house, shuts the door. Here's the deal. I don't know what's going on in Scott's life, but God does. He sees behind the doors. He sees the things that you and I carry. He hears if Charlie gets a bad report about his wife. And he sees the weight that Charlie feels. And, 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 and so God says, I don't just see their suffering. I've heard their cries. And I just want you to know this morning. I mean, you, you need to know that God definitely, he hears. He knows. He's concerned. He says, I want to come into that. I got better plans. I got a life for you. Your life is not just doing the same old, same old to where you can't ever see light. He says, I didn't call you to live in darkness. I called you to live in light. That's the first word. Now, we need a plan, which is the second word. There's a hope, but then there's got to be a plan. And God speaks to Moses again. He said, let me tell you how this thing's going to play out. He says, I got to rescue them. I'm going to do four things. And we, we look in the book of Exodus, three chapters over in Exodus chapter 6. I think it's verses 6 and 7. God said, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the land of the Egyptians. And I will uh, free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and I will take you as my own people. He said, we're going to do four things about this. 
I think this is, I think this is pretty awesome. And I tell you, it, it's the way he did it back then, but it's the way he still does it today. First thing he says is he says, I got to get you out of there. I got to get you out of Egypt. We got we to gotta get you out from under Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. You got to be free. God said, we can't fix this by you confessing positive thoughts and having, uh, having sweet thoughts and being a better person. God never said, I need you to be a better person over there in Egypt. You're a, you're a bad person as a slave. You got too much bitterness. God said, no, I got to get you out of there. And that is a picture of salvation. That is a picture of what God does with us. The Bible says in Colossians that he delivers us from a kingdom of darkness and he brings us into a, his, the kingdom of his son. And I don't know where you are this morning, but I'm just saying you, you, you can't fix it when you're over in the darkness. God's not asking you to make yourself better over there. He says, I need you to be born again. I want to give you a new heart. You need, you need to have that power of sin, that grip over your life, broken so that you can serve me. You can't serve me over there. You're trying to. You know you need to be a better person. But he said, let's get you out of that darkness. Then he said, I got to get Egypt out of you. I got you out of Egypt, but you still got a bunch of junk up here in the way you look at life. I don't know about you, but I think we've all been there. You come out of that stuff, but, but there's still that old thinking. He says, you got some bitterness. You've got some addictions. You got some things going in your life. We got to set a pattern. We got to get, we got to work on some of these. But I love you. I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to free you. I'm going to free you. I'm going to help you get rid of some of that stuff. Then he says, I'm going to redeem you. That word redeem actually means to restore you to what you were originally created for. I think you guys may have had, even had a, a kind of a series on it this summer. You don't mind if I repeat myself a little bit, huh? And so God says, God says, I'm going to restore you to what I designed you for. I've given you some incredible gifts. You couldn't use those. You're just getting up every day being a slave. He said, I give, I've, given, I've designed you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You would be so, if you could begin to see what I've done in your life, you would love it. And then he says, I'm going to set you as a part of a team. Now, let me tell you real quick how that played out in my life. My story, I'm over here when I'm in my, in my teens, and I'm just, I'm just a worldly guy. I went to church when I was younger, but I just was a worldly guy and do, doing the things of the world, and really, really just sin was in my life. I'm going to be honest, I was not really seeking after God. Which is why I say I love the fact, one of, my, one of the parts of my testimony, one of the parts of my story is that God was going after me even when I wasn't going after him. And so I met this guy, I ran into this fellow in college, and he had recently gotten saved, and he said, hey, could we grab a cup of coffee? So I said, sure. So we grabbed some coffee, we drank a cup of coffee in between classes, and he started telling me what, how much he loved Jesus, what Jesus had done in his life. And he said, how about you? And I said, oh, we went to the such and such a bar the night before, and, you know, we just had a good time, and I'm headed to class. How about you? And he said, yeah, me too. And so we got up and left. So a few days later, he said, hey, you want to get some coffee again? I said, sure. So he told me about what Jesus was doing in his life. I told him about what I was doing in my life, and we talked. This kept going, not for a few days, not for a few weeks, but for months. I still don't know why the guy was so patient with me. He should have just moved on, you know, like this guy was not interested. But inside, something was happening. Some of you can relate to this testimony. Inside, the pendulum started swinging because I started being, I was impressed with the way he knew God. And I realized I didn't. I realized I had the darkness in me started getting darker and the light that he had, I started wanting. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about? And so one Saturday morning, I got up, I went to a little prayer room on campus. I didn't know where to pray, didn't know where to read in my Bible. But the whole time, I just knew one thing, that I had to surrender. I had to let go. It was a battle of the wills. And God was saying, if you're going to, 
If I'm going to work in your life, you've got to let go. And so I got down on my knees. I said, Jesus, I need you, and I'm willing to let you be the boss. And I got up from my knees. There was no warm and fuzzies or anything like that. But when I stood up, I can't explain. Something was just different. That power of sin that had held me captive was broken. And, it, and my heart was turned to God. I started wanting to pray. I started wanting to read my Bible. Nobody came up and said, you need to read your Bible. I just said, man, i got to find out what this thing says. I just started reading my Bible. I started praying. I mean, I, I got... I, I decided one day, this is kind of silly, but I, I don't know. You know, it's funny how you get things in your brain. And I thought, well, now the pastor says you're supposed to give 10% to the church. I wonder if I should give 10% of my time. I said, wow, well, that's uh, two hours and 20 minutes a day. Maybe I'm supposed to pray for two hours and 20 minutes a day. How in the world would I do that? So I got four different note cards, and I'd write down. I had a bunch of friends in the world, and I'd write them down. So every 30 minutes, I mean, uh, for 30 minutes, I'd go behind the football stadium or I'd go somewhere else, I'd pray. You know, I didn't do that forever, but I'm just saying my heart was turned towards God. I just wanted to get closer. He freed me. But then God said, now this is the second part of that. He said, now you got some issues in your life. We got to deal with some of those. I thought it was about the cussing. He said, no, it's not about the cussing. It's about the words you say. I want them to be words that build people up instead of cutting them down. Uh, and so, man, I felt that. So I got a group of about three or four guys together. We'd all kind of been recently saved. I said, man, let me tell you what the Lord's been putting on my heart. I said, I feel like i got to watch what I say. One guy said, wow, that's deep, man. <laughs> you, know, you know how you are. Oh, dude, that's deep. Another guy said, man, maybe I need to do that. So we prayed for each other. Well, we worked on it. I didn't become perfect. I still struggled with that a little bit, you know. But, but it, it was a big shift for me. And then God put his finger on something else. He said, now, you've been looking backwards on this. I want you to look forward. He said, you've got to let go of this. I mean, there were some things that fell off just like that. And there were a couple of others that, boy, they just hung on. You know what? Y'all don't have that problem in Joplin. But... Down, down, down where I was, we were having that issue, you know. But we would get together, these, these four guys, and we'd just talk and, we'd talk, and we would encourage each other. I'm telling you, that's the best place to deal with your issues, right. and it's in, is in a group of friends. Right. You know, I'm not going to walk in the door and announce, hey, everybody, i got such and such a problem, but I don't mind if i got some people in my life that love me and that I can be real with. Sometimes I'd go to a group, and I wouldn't say anything, but a guy over there on the other side would tell, say what he was thinking, and I'd just think to myself, yep, i got to work on that too. So he's dealing with the issues. So he gets me out of the darkness, then he gets some of those big issues out of the way, and I'm still working on them. I will till the Lord returns, but uh, I, I get in a place where I don't have all those issues in my life. Then he said, now I've given you some gifts. I said, oh, okay, cool. There was a guy that came up to me. And he, he had me read Romans 12. And he says, there's a, there's a list of seven gifts in Romans 12. He says, you got one of those. I said, really? So he, he told me the one he thought. And, I th and he was right on. And when I, when I realized that, it just did something in my life. I started, I found when I walked into a room, one of those seven gifts is the way that I tend to relate to people. And it made me feel good that I didn't have some of the other gifts, so I wasn't under the pressure about that. So I felt good. Man, I got a gift. This is awesome. I got a gift. I wasn't prideful. I just was excited. I got a gift. God thinks I'm good enough to, not good enough, but you know, that I'm, he can trust me with a gift. But God said, hey, this is not all about one gift. He said, I have hardwired you into some ways that I have not hardwired anybody else. You think of things in ways that, that, some, uh, that others don't. And he began to open my eyes to it. And I began to see those different layers of design. I'm telling you guys, I'm not the only one in this room that's got that. I think every one of us in this room are full of, of gifts and purposes. And I would say... I would venture to say that most of us, if we've tapped into a little, a little bit, 
I guarantee you there's a whole lot more. Pursue the Lord. Ask God to open up the eyes of your heart and show you what he's called you to. I'm telling you, you will be amazed. And it doesn't all come at one time. I'm telling you, I've been in the Lord now for 30 years. And, and, and even this year, I began to see a new little level of leadership that I didn't know was there. Okay, everybody with me? And then the last thing is he puts us on a team. And I have realized that was the four things. You remember that? He, he said, I'm going to bring you out of, uh, bring you out of Egypt. I'm going to get some Egypt out of you. I'm going to start redeeming you to what you were called for. And then I'm going to make you a people of mine. I'm going to put you on a team. There is a first class team at this church. I'm telling you, I, you, get, you got some great leadership in this church. You've got some leaders that you can emulate. You know, we all just follow Jesus, but I'm telling you, there's some leaders that have gone before you that are good, good men and women that you can, that you can, you can trust and you can, you, can, you can let them speak into your lives and you can see the character in them. And so the team comes along because I look at things one way and somebody else looks at it another. Some of you in this room are very creative. You just, you think that way. Some of you can take the worst situation. You can take a pile of junk and you just know exactly how to put it together and make it work. Uh, some of you are, are big picture. Some of you are detailed. There's just all kinds of ways, but it works together as a team. So God brings the hope. He says, now here's the plan. I got to get you out of Egypt. Got to get Egypt out of you. Got to show you some things that I purpose for you. There's destiny there. And then I'm going to make you a part of a team. The last word I want to give you is a win. Because God doesn't just, he doesn't just give us a hope and say, I know about what's going on. He gives us a plan to get out of it. But then the plan is not the end result. The end result is a win. And by the way, can I tell you something? If you will get into your purpose, if you'll get into the things that God has purposed you for, it's a lot easier to, to stay holy. When I say stay holy, in other words, you don't battle as, with sin as much. When you don't have direction, when you just kind of burn out, you go home, you flip through the channels, you're just trying to, you, 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 you don't have anything that gets you out of bed and puts a pep in your step. That, that, that brightens your eyes. You can tell when you get around somebody and you ask them what, what they're doing and they start telling you about what's going on and their eyes kind of brighten you, you fit their sweet spot because that's the thing that fires them up. When you get something like that, it's a lot easier to walk with Jesus. You just feel like, feel like you're going somewhere. And that's what this last point is about, is a win. God wants to give every one of us a win. I pulled this, this kind of unique scripture um, and this is my last scripture. I'll kind of wind up. But in Numbers chapter 21, I'm going to read three verses. It says, The Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that the Israelites, now they've come out of Egypt, they're on their way to the promised land. He heard that they were approaching the uh, road, and so he attacked them and took some of them as prisoners. Then the people of Israel made this vow to the Lord, if you will hand these people over to us, we will completely destroy all their towns. And the Lord heard the Israelites' request and gave them victory over the Canaanites. Here's why this story is important. You say, man, what does that mean? God had been working with this group of people when he brought them out of Egypt, and they were, they were not easy to work with. I mean, they were whiners. They were complaining. God kept working with them. He kept saying, I got purpose in your life. He said, we're going somewhere. I'm bringing you to this fabulous land. You're going to love this place. And all they could focus on was just the bigness of the problems. Have you ever been around somebody like that? Maybe you've been there yourself. I think we all have seasons where we just see the bigness of the problem. God kept saying, I, I know, but he said, I'm going to help you with all that. I want to bring you to this great place. And so many of them couldn't see it. 
And so there was this older generation. They kept thinking, man, maybe we should go back to Egypt, which is stupid, but, I mean, that's what they were thinking, you know. But here's what happened. It was a shift. Some young, young bucks began to rise up, some young guys and girls, some, some, some people. They're, they're, you don't read about it. This is the first time you read about this shift. They're just marching along. And so this king, this, this enemy comes up behind them and attacks them and takes some of them as prisoners. And what would have happened in so many chapters before, you would have heard the people begin to whine. Oh, God, why did you bring us here? This is awful. Look, the people are attacking us. But these young bucks, these young, this, these guys begin to say, whoa, what just happened? Did somebody attack us? Did they get some prisoners? Oh, no. No, we're not, we're not having any of that. God, if you will give us power, if you'll be with us, we'll go attack them. We'll go deal with it. We'll go handle it. And they, and they take off, and they attack these guys, and they get all the prisoners back, and you feel like, man, there's some leaders in the house again. <laughs> it's not all this whiny bunch. And I think that's what God wants to do in every one of us. Something that begins to rise up and say, God, you have brought me out of the dark places. You've been patient with me. You've helped me deal with some issues. You've started showing me my call, my purpose. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go handle some things. As my old pastor used to say, I'm ready to go bear hunting with a switch. I'm ready to, <laughs> kind of a weird phrase, but you know, you just have this visual of a big bear and you don't care. You got, you got this little limb. You're going to take care of business. There is a psalm, and I'm not going to read it because it's 50 verses long, but it's Psalm 18, and it's in the Bible two different times, which makes me think it's important. And David tells his story about how he was in one of the darkest places of his life. He felt like he was being swallowed up. Some of you may feel that right now. You just feel like, man, it just I don't, I don't, see, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It got so bad that David despaired of life. He said, I just, I don't know that I can keep on. And he uses this imagery that's very, and I think it's not just imagery, I think it's real, but it was very interesting the way he frames it up. He says, I looked and he said, God mounted some cherubim, some angels. He hopped up on some angels and he said, fire and smoke was coming out of his nostrils. And he said, oh, no, I, my boy ain't going down. And he swooped down and he grabbed me and he picked me up and he, he delivered me from that. That's a great part, but the psalm doesn't stop there. He says, God took me out of that dark place and he brought me over here and he put me in this spacious place. You know, God does that. He, 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 he doesn't just bring you out, but Psalm 23 says he causes me to lie down in green pastures. God wants to bring you to a place where it's not so chaotic. He said, let me get you over here, kind of get you protected. And God, he said, God just started taking care of me. He said, I kind of dusted myself off. I felt like, I felt strength again. I felt hope again. I felt like things were going to happen. And then he said, God just kept strengthening me. And he said, he, he started setting my feet on solid ground. And he said, I started thinking to myself, man, I could, I could run through a troop. I could leap over a wall, man. I, I, I'm feeling it again. I feel, I feel, I feel like I've had a Red Bull. I, you know, <laughs> anyway, but I, I, feel like, I feel like I could do something again. I, I began to get s strong. And then all of a sudden I said, God, I got this. And, and I went out there and he says, I just... I just, I just started attacking my enemies, and he said, I just beat them as fine as dust. <laughs> you can just hear how fired up he is. He's, he's excited. And he said, man, thank God. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, my savior, my deliverer. Kind of all the things that, that Heather was singing about and talking about this morning. I mean, just praising God. That's what he does in every one of us. We're in low places. He brings us out. He holds us tight. He says, you can be all right. I'm going to help you. I'm going to restore you. He sets us over here, gets our feet on solid ground. We get our footing again, get strong. He said, now, hey, you can do this thing. You, you got it. Dust yourself off. We're going for round two. I know, but this was my round two. And yeah, all right, we're going for round three, the Lord says. He says, this doesn't matter. 
He said, a righteous man can fall seven times, but he gets up again. Because of God, your God is with you. And I just feel like that word is for some of you this morning. That you, God says, hey, let, 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 me, let me bring you out of the dark places, but we're not just bringing you out. I got purpose. I want to help you deal with your issues. I want to help you see, your, see what I've created you for. And he says, and, and I'm going to give you some wins in your life. There's some wins. There's some, there's some great things. I'm telling you, there are some great things that are yet to come out of this church. The hand of God is on this church. The hand of God is on you. So let's bow our heads in prayer.